My name is Mark Elliott. I'm executive director of Floridians for Alternatives to the Death Penalty. And we say FADP because it's such a long title. But uh, what we do, we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan uh, organization that represents groups and coalitions and individuals throughout Florida with a single purpose and that's to abolish the death penalty in Florida. And so we're the network that all, the communications go through, the organizing, everything. Typically, we're involved in just about everything that happens. So, so it's not just a single voice, it's a chorus of voices from a lot of different perspectives, and particularly diverse perspectives. Um, <laughs> uh, I started in this about 15 years ago. Like you, I had questions about what was going on, and I had an open mind, and 15 years later, I'm, this is what I do. Uh, my wife, I live in Tampa, my wife passed away not that long ago, and she, was, uh, she had a master's in special ed. And, uh, and when we were first dating, and I was really starting to, to fall for her, she asked me, she says, well, so what is this about the death penalty? What is it about this that, is so important to you that drives you, and why? So, <laughs> since she taught special ed, she was a very patient listener, and she could refine something down to a real, you know, a few simple to remember nuggets of information to share with her students. So, she listened patiently as I went through that, the realities of the death penalty. One is mistakes are made, people like Juan and there's 25 more people just in recent history, innocent people wrongfully convicted who were on death row, sometimes within days or, or weeks of being executed. And, and I talked to her about the cost, that it cost over $50 million a year just to have the death penalty on the books, just to try to enforce it. That's over and above the cost of the only alternative in Florida, which is life in prison without the possibility of parole, which is, in, its, in essence, it's a death sentence as well. It just doesn't involve the killing. Uh, I told her that never in the history of Florida had a white person been executed for killing an African American. Not once, not ever. Out of hundreds of executions over 100 and almost 80 years, it's never happened. It could happen someday, but it hasn't happened yet. That speaks to the reality of, of what it is. When the number of lynchings went down in Florida, led the nation per capita in lynchings, when the number went down, executions picked up. It's, it's pretty clear what, it, what the intent has been, and in practice today still is. Um, and I talked to her about the other nations that use the death penalty like we do. We've been in the top five executing nations in the world of... For the last 20 years, we missed two years. Last year, we missed out. We didn't make it in the, the cut for the top five. The top five typically are China, Saudi Arabia, Iran, uh, North Korea probably is there, but they don't divulge the numbers. So that's the company we keep as, as a democracy, as a republic. Those are the ones that share our values when it comes to the executions. And I told her, you know, if you listen to what the governor says when an execution is carried out, the governor will say, well, it was solemn, and it was dignified, and it was humane. And the reality is, it's none of that. It's none of that. There's no humane way to take a captive, secured captive prisoner and put them to death, whether you hang them or poison them or electrocute them or shoot them. There's no humane way to do it. The act itself is inhumane. Uh, and so I went on and on. And so she listened. And she goes, so what you're trying to say is, if we want to live in a world that's less violent and more humane, then we need to be less violent and more humane. And I was like, <laughs> I just spent 20 minutes explaining it. That's it. That's it. So. She, had a, she boiled it down to that. Um, today, you're going to hear from Juan Roberto Melendez Colon. Juan Melendez. And uh, Juan has lived this tale. Juan experienced this journey. And, and I'd like to introduce Juan Melendez.
Thank you, everybody. <clears throat> Before I start, uh, I want to thank God for keeping me alive all this time. I want to take thank anybody that was responsible to make this event happen. And obvious, I want to thank all of you for being here. My name is Juan Roberto Melendez. I am the number 99 person in the nation to be released and exonerated from death row for a crime I did not commit. But my story is not that all unique. It's 157 of us. Has been 1,442 executions. Many of them in the state of Texas. They are real cowboys down there. And only God knows how many of them did not have the luck that I had in the rest of 156. As I tell my story, if you feel like crying, cry. If you feel like laughing, please laugh. I love smiling faces. The only favor I ask all of you is this. Please don't fall asleep on me. It was a beautiful day. I never forgot it. It was on a Monday, May the 2nd, 1984, while my co-workers and I was eating lunch under an apple tree. We hear noise in the orchards that did not belong to the orchards. It was about eight police cars riding the hills, FBI agents, and they stopped in front of us. And they came out of the car pointing weapon at us, and they told us to hit the ground, and we did. Then they called my name. But I was scared to get up because of the weapon that was pointing at me. But I raised my arms. Then they told me to get up and walk toward them, and I did. When I got in front of them, they wanted me to open my mouth. They wanted to see if I had a missing tooth. And I showed it to them. Today, I fist them. <laughs> and I'm still working on it. Then they told me to roll the sleeves of my shirt from my left arm. They wanted to see a tattoo. And I show it to them. Then they say, yes, you are the man we are looking for. You are wanted for unlawfully fly to avoid prosecution. We warrant for your arrest for first degree murder and armed robbery in the state of Florida. So they read me some rights and they slapped some handcuffs on me. And they throw me in a police car. They took me to a federal prison. A week or so after that, they took me to court in front of a magistrate, a federal judge, and he was talking about extradition. But I did not know what extradition mean. I was naive to the law, naive to the language. This is the type of English I know at that time. If I say five words in English, believe me, my friend, three of them would be cuss words. <laughs> so the brother interpreted to me to explain to me what extradition mean. And all he told me Spanish was, you either wave it, or fight it. They're going to take you back anyway. So I start thinking, I'm not a killer. My mama did not raise no killers. I will wave this tradition. As soon as they see this ugly face in Florida, they will let me go. But how wrong I was. So I wave this tradition, and they said, it's me from the state of Pennsylvania all the way back to the state of Florida. A week or so after my arrival, they took me to court in front of a judge. And he was reading the charges to me. You've been indicted, arrested for first degree murder and armed robbery, and the state of Florida is thinking the death penalty against you, the electric share. A week or so after that, they took me right back to court to, with the same judge, to court upon a lawyer for me, a public defender. The truth is, I'm down with Jay Simpson. I don't have money to hire lawyers. So this public defender comes to me, and, and I can hardly understand what he's saying because they never gave me an interpreter. But he used to pop in the back and tell me that everything is going to be all right. You're going home. I did understood that going home stuff. I should go home. I did not commit the crime. So now we're going to trial. Monday, we start picking the jury. Tuesday, we're still picking jury. After they pick 11 whites, one African-American person, a black man, no Hispanic, and I'm Hispanic, the red instruction to the jury how to conduct themselves in a capital murder case with the sinking, the death penalty. Wednesday, that's when the evidence come in. This is what they had against me. They have what they call a police informant. What they call in the streets a snitch. He claimed that I confessed the crime to him. 
The same police informant, the same snitch, also implicates a friend of mine in the crime. He gets arrested. He gets interrogated. He makes 15 statements. He incriminates himself in the crime. He gets charged with it. First degree murder, armed robbery, and they threaten him with the electric chair. It's time to make a deal. You see, prosecutors in the United States, they make deals with criminals. So he was able to strike a deal with the state. He gets his first degree murder charge dropped. He gets his armed robbery charge dropped, all the way to accessory after the facts. No more threats of the electric chair. He gets two years probation, with two years he already had. And basically what he said in trial was this. I picked him up, took him to the scene of the crime, dropped him off, came an hour and a half later, picked him up again, took him home, don't know what happened to after they happened. That's the entire evidence against me. No physical evidence against me. That the testimony of two questionable witnesses with a criminal record from coast to coast. Two, crim two questionable witnesses that make deals with the state, deals with the prosecutor, and they get lenses and rewards for their own crimes they commit. This is what I had on my favor on the defense side. I have what you call an alibi witness. I had other witnesses testifying saying that the police informant, the snitch, had a gun against me. But I had a problem. A big witness that I had on my side was from the African-American race. A black man, a black woman. And when a black man and a black woman testify for the state, for the prosecutor, all of a sudden they got good credibility. But when a black woman and a black man testify for the defense on my side, all of a sudden, the credibility is gone. Thursday, they found me guilty. Friday, the very next day, they're sending me to death. And when they're sending me to death, my heart got full of hate. Hate the prosecutor. Hate the, hated the judge. Hated the jurors. And I hated that one that packed me in the back, my trial defense lawyer, because I felt he betrayed me. But overall, I thought we Puerto Rican men was real macho men. I found out different. I was scared. Very scared to die for a crime I did not commit. So now I'm going to death row. That was an ugly day. I never forgot it. It was on a Tuesday, November the 2nd, 1984. The place was horrified. It was dark. It was cold. And they kept me in a six by nine foot cell. And every time they move me out of that cell for whatever reasons, I got charcoals in my legs, chains in my waist, and hackles in my wrists. The place was also infected with rats and roaches. So they threw me down in the bottom floor. 17, 16 condemned death row prisoners in the bottom floor. 16 in the second one, 16 in the third. And I made the 248 men condemned to death in the state of Florida. And they restated the death penalty in the nation in 1976. The food, they put the food in the car, and they wheel the car in the floor, in the wing where you at. And breakfast, oh, that's the worst one. But not because of the food. I love grits and eggs. It's because they come too early and they never wake you up. And they place that breakfast tray in the front that you have in your cell door, like a big mail slack. And if you wait five seconds and you bunk to get up and get that tray, forget about it. You ain't ran out of luck. You see, the roaches and beat you to it. They waiting for the breakfast too. And it get cold in northern Florida. The supply was with a thin blanket. And I take that blanket and I cover, cover my foot, face and all. I don't want to see nothing. But the rats, they also get cold and they want to get warm. So they kind that blanket. And I can feel that rat that's running up and down. And I don't want to look at them. Because if I look at them, I'm not going to be able to sleep. But when that rat stays still in my chest and he's not moving, I get a good grip of the blanket and I shake it hard as I can. And I can hear that rat hit the floor. Boom! It is a big one. So I arrive over there on a, on a Tuesday. Not that Thursday. The following Thursday, they has killed a 10 person in the state of Florida. When I leave that place, 51 
today, 90, and still counting. But when they secured that 10th person, I got super scared. You see, I do not know the process. I do not know the language that well. I'm lost in there. So they toss in my mind is this. They're killing people here every week. How long is going to be before they get me? Go off. So I know how to box. So I know, and I know all this exercise. You can keep your muscle flexible and you can defend yourself. So I'm thinking, if they come over here to get me, I'm just going to fight them. And I'm walking to that chair. When I think about it, I'm scared of electricity anyway. So I had to come up with a plan. I take the cheese from my bunk, and I cut it all in pieces. And I take them pieces, and I make little ropes with it. And I take these ropes, and I, these little ropes, and I tie the cell door bars. You see the cell door bars slide like this. So I tie this in. When they push that button in the control room, that door ain't moving nowhere. So I'm thinking, by the time they call all these little ropes all up, I can give me a good warm up. And when they come and get me, I'm just going to fight it. So now I'm doing exercise, and I'm sweating real good. I'm trying to make muscles come out of my eyebrows. You see, I'm trying to intimidate these people. I'm trying to scare them. But all the time, I'm the one scared. I'm the one intimidated. So the, bar, the cell door bars are all tied up. And it's around count time. And here come the correction officer doing his, his round of counts. It's a big, tall African-American person, a big black man. He had muscle in his eyebrows. So when he see the doors all tied up, he gets angry. And he starts cursing. Melendez, why you got the damn doors all tied up? And he cursed and cursed and cursed. I do not know too much English, but I know how to curse. So in a very, very bad way, I remind him of his mother, father, all the way down. <laughs> so me and the correction office, we discussing each other's out. And the rest of the command, condemned men to death got involved in the argument. But to my surprise, he was against me. They tell me that I'm wrong. So now I get angry with them. And I tell them the best way I can. I know they're killing people here every week. And we ain't doing nothing. We're supposed to fight these people. We're supposed to burn the place down. We Puerto Ricans don't go out like that doing nothing. We fight. They still told me that I was crazy, that I was a fool. They told me that all I do is get up in the morning and get in the cell door bars and nag and curse and cry about my innocence. Then they told me that I did not know how to read. I did not know how to write. And I did not know how to speak English. Then they told me the most beautiful thing I could hear at that time. They told me they would teach me. The worst of the worst. The most undesirable and hated people in the nation. The one that some prosecutors call monsters. Told this Puerto Rican how to read, how to write, how to speak English. If they would never taught me, I would never survive that place. I would never be able to communicate better with my lawyers. I would not be able to reply the letter that so many pen pals wrote me. Some of them for this great state of Florida. They show me so much love, so much compassion that make me feel like a human being. And today, I would not be able to share with all of you this sad story. I spent 17 years, eight months, and one day in Florida death row for a crime I did not commit. After 10 years, I was tired of it. I went out of there. But the only way out is to commit suicide. And believe me, lots of my friends committed suicide. And I'm going to tell you how they do it. They got what they call a runner. A runner is an inmate that's doing time in prison population. He's not sentenced to death. And they give this runner, this inmate, at a prison population so he can do the work in the dead row place. You see, the correction officer, they don't do nothing. All they do is watch you. And some of them give you a hard time when they can. This runner, this inmate, that's not sentenced to death, he is the one that supplies us with the food, the toothbrush, the toothpaste, 
They mop in the broom so you can clean yourself. But he also can supply you with a tool that you can take your life with. And he knows it. All you got to do is give him a packet of rolling cigarette paper tobacco, the cheap kind. And he will give you this tool. Or four post stamps. And he will give you this tool. Perhaps he do it because these items that are just mentioned are more important to him than your life. Or perhaps he do it because he calls himself assisting you, helping you. He works there. He know you want out of there. He know that their row is hell. The tool is real simple. It's a garbage plastic bag, the one you see in the garbage can. You give him four, four pole stamps, and when the guard is looking, he will swing that bag inside yourself. You take that bag and you twist it up and you make a rope. Then you put a noose in it. You put the noose in your neck and you tie the other part in the cell door bars. You throw yourself down, you're dead, but you're free. That's what the demons used to tell me. Why? Why you got to go to all of this? You're supposed to be a Puerto Rican man, a real macho man. Don't satisfy them. Satisfy yourself. You say you didn't do it, you think they're going to believe you? They're going to kill you anyway. So grab that bag. And that thought stay in my mind. I never saw my friends kill themselves because I cannot see through the walls. But I always see when they wheel the body out. Something in the back of my head tells me, you're not going to look at your friend for the last time. So I have a mirror in myself. I grab it, and I stretch my arm to the bars with it, and I look, and this is what I see. I see a purple blue face that do not look like my friend. I get to see something else, too. I get to see the noose in his neck, because they never take it out, and, and that stay in my mind. So now I want to take this trip. You see, I'm tired of it. I want out of there. I'm depressed. So I tell the runner, give me, give me, give me that garbage bag. So I give him four stamps, and when the guy went looking, he swing that bag inside, the runner swing that bag inside my, my cell. I took that bag, and I twisted it up, and I made a rope. Then I put a noose in it. Then I look at my bunk, and I look at the rope. And I say to myself, I better lay down and think about this a little bit more. So I took the rope that I was made to take my life with, and I throw it on the bunk so the guards, when they walk by, they don't see it. And I lay down. When I lay down, I, I fell in a deep, deep, deep sleep. And I start dreaming that I'm a little kid again, doing the things I used to do when I was a little kid, the things that make me happy, the things that make me smile. You see, I born in Brooklyn, New York, but I was raised in the island of Puerto Rico. They took me back when I was this little kid. And when I get up in the morning and I look to the east side, it's a wonderful mountain. And if I walk six minutes toward the south, I find myself in the most beautiful beach in the world. It is to me. So here I am, dreaming that I'm swimming in the beautiful Caribbean Sea. The water is warm. The sun is so bright. The sky is so blue. The palm trees look so good. It's a beautiful day. Then I get to see something that I never saw before. Four dolphins coming my way. And they pass me. Then they turn around. And they pair got on one side. And they pair got on another side. And they start jumping and flipping like dolphins do. I'm having a ball in there. I'm so happy. Then I look to the shore. And it's a beautiful woman waving at me, throwing kisses at me, smiling at me. And she seems so happy. And I know why she's happy. She's happy because I'm happy. That's my dear mother. And then I wake up. When I wake up, the bones smell like a beach. So I grabbed that rope that I just made to take my life with. And I went straight to the toilet with it. And I look at the toilet, and I look at the rope, and I say real loud, I don't want to die. And I flush it. But the truth of is, it was lots and lots and lots of beautiful dreams. Every time I got depressed, every time I went out of there, every time suicide thoughts came to my mind, our creator God sent me a beautiful dream. And I was wise enough 
to grab hold and dreams as a sign of hope that one day I will be out of there, that I will be free. Like God was telling me, hey, I know you didn't do it, but I control the time. You get out. When I say you get out, you just got to trust me. And when I analyze everything, I come to one conclusion. It took 17 years, eight months, and one day to also change the man. The death penalty. The death penalty is a law that brings a lot of collateral damage from both sides of the family. Or the family victim of homicides. And the family of the woman and man that's condemned to death. Was finally concerned, this is all I had. Mama and five ants. I do, know, I do not know how the ants are in this generation. But in my generation, when I was growing up, if my aunt caught me doing something wrong, believe me, my friends, it's going to be a good ass whooping. And then I got to get on my knees and pray to God that she don't tell mama. Because when she tell mama, it's going to be another good ass whooping. But when I was hungry, my aunts always fed me. When I needed clothes, my aunts always bought it from me. And in that row, they never forgot me. They wrote me lots and lots of letters. They sent me lots and lots of photos of the one that born and I never seen. And I saw all of them grow up to pictures. They love to keep the family together. And mama, I have to tell you, I believe she suffered more than anybody. She also wrote me lots and lots of letters that gave me so much hope that helped me keep the will to live. But it's one letter that I keep with me all the time. And when I'm down and out, sad and weak, I read it, and it always boosts me up. And it goes like this. She wrote and says, son, I just built an altar. In that altar, I put the statue of the Virgin of the Guadalupe in it. And I call roses, and I put it in it. And I pray three rosaries a day, sinking, searching, looking for a miracle. And that miracle will come soon, because I know you're innocent. And God knows that you're innocent. But you got to put all your trust in God, in, and one day, he will send you free. 17 years, eight months, and one day later, the miracle came through. Thank you, God, but it took too long, God. And this I find out. A week or so after I was released from death row, I went to my mama's room and, and I noticed that tears was running down her cheeks. And I said, Mama, what's wrong? And she said, Son, in spite of all that faith and hope that I have in God and the vision of the Guadalupe, for all them years, for all them long, long years, I was saving money to bring your dead body back to the island of Puerto Rico and bury you. And no mother in this world should go to that pain. The conditions, very especially the medical conditions and some of the type of people that work in these places. Oh, you better not get sick in death row. You see, they, they love to use common sense. Why well, give you, a person condemned to death, the best medication? When the governor can sign you that one today and kill you tomorrow. Why waste the best medication and somebody condemned to death? In order for you to, to understand or comprehend the condition and some of the type of people that work in these places, unfortunately, I have to share with you another sad story. We go to the yard four hours a week for exercise. Two hours on a Monday, two hours on a Wednesday, if it's not raining. All they got to see is uh, that cloud in the sky. In climate weather today, no yard, no recreation. It's not one a drop of rain falling. But this Monday, we all went. All the ones that told me how to read, how to write, how to speak English. But very particularly, this African-American person, this black man, I call them brothers. They all told me how to read and how to write, but this one in here, he was butchy. You need to learn this. You need to learn that. And I love him dear for that, because I learned a lot from him. The brothers, they love to play bas basketball. Some others, they play volleyball. I lift weights, 
because I like to burn steam and, and go back to the cell and rest a little bit better. So my brother, he playing basketball. And all of a sudden, he falls to the ground. And we all stopped what we was doing and ran close to him. When I got close to him, I noticed that white foam was coming out of his mouth and out of his nose. So I assumed this, this got to be a stroke, a, a heart attack. So we tell the guards in the gate, you have a man down there that need medical assistance. So they take the time with a walking, talking, and they, call, and they call the clinic. And here come the so-called nurse. He's a tall white man with a big great belly. And they let him inside, inside the gate. And they told us in the yard to put our back to the fence. And from the gun towers, they point machine guns at you. And you better not move. They will shoot you. So now, the so-called nurse is inside the yard. And I noticed he had no medical bag, but he had something. He had a half, about a half a pound of sugar tobacco in his mouth. And you can see that black stuff running to the side. And every once in a while, he spits. He is in the yard now, and he's a brother in the ground. So we tell him, he's not breathing. He need air. So the so-called nurse say, I got to go back to the clinic and get an oxygen tank. So he walks real slow with his proud and arrogant self back to the clinic. Come back walking real slow with his arrogant and proud self back to the yard. He bends down and puts the accent tag in my friend's mouth. And then the nurse get up and we tell him, he's still not breathing. He need air. And the so-called nurse say, I got to go back again to the clinic and get another accent tank. This one in here is not working. And he spits. I tell him, you don't have to. You can do CPR mouth to mouth. But tell him one of them to do mouth to mouth to a brother in the ground. You're wasting your time. So the nurse looks up. Then the nurse looks down. He made a statement using these two racist words. The N and the M, and I'm not putting my mouth in there. I said, you don't have to. I do it. You just do the counting. And he agreed. I'm so glad he agreed. I'm trying to save my friend's life. So I rushed down there. And I took my T-shirt off. And I wiped the white foam my friend got in his mouth and nose. And the so-called nurse, he started counting. One, two, three. And I blow air. One, two, three. And I blow air again. One, two, three. I blow air and my friend open his eyes. I see a sign of hope. He's going to live. But all of a sudden, his eyes rolled back. He made a front with his face and mouth that I can see it right now because he never left me. Then he breathed real hard and, and air came out. I think that was his soul that left him because he died right in my arms. So now I'm angry and I want to do something to this so-called nurse that let my friend die in the yard like a dog. When I finish swing at him, he come the rest of the condemned men to death. Snatch me out of there. Throw me in the corner. And they say, Puerto Rican Johnny, don't get in no more trouble that you are already in. We got other ways to handle this. I still go to the box, to the hole, to confinement for 90 days for the respect and the memory of the staff, whatever that means. And it's to get in a ride. But I learned a lesson. I learned that I had to think look and trust something more powerful than the system. And the only thing I could see that's more powerful than the system is our creator, God. Some of them become Muslims, and they praise Allah, and they teach others how to respect, how to read, how to write, how to speak English, how to become a better man. Some of them become Buddhists. I don't know what they worship. But they teach others how to love, how to have compassion, how to find a way to forgive. Some of them become Christians. That's what I did. I had to go back to my roots and remember everything my mama told me about Virgin Mary, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost. The true wish is Catholic to the bones. And this is my personal opinion, and only mine. I believe we're serving the same God with different names. That all we got to do is make do good deeds and, and make good choices in life. And we had no problem going, going to heaven. This friend of mine that stayed the floor, let him die in the yard like a dog. 
one month after his death, he wins a new trial. But the state of Florida letting my friend die in the yard like a dog. The state of Florida denied my friend his right to prove his innocence. So now you know all about the suffering pain of the families and the suffering pain of the condemned man. Let me tell you the worst. The worst is when they execute someone. You see, I'm in this cell. Next to me is another person condemned to death that I know for 10 or 15 years, perhaps more. He cries in my shoulders. I cry in his. He shared with me his most intimate thoughts. I share mine with him. I learned to grow, to love him. And one day they slash him out of that cell. And I know what's going to happen. They're going to kill him. And I cannot stop it. In my time, it's the electric chair. And they got to generate the chair with electricity. Because it's 2010 volts that got to go to his body in order to get him killed. And I can hear this bossy sound. Uh, uh, uh. That's still in my mind. And I know precisely the time when they burned the life out of him. Because the lights flip on and off. And I cannot stop it. But the saddest thing at all is this. Some of them are innocent. Like Jesse DeFaro, Benny Dent, Leo Jones, Pedro Medina, and my homeboy from Puerto Rico, that the state of Florida, on a legal plea bargain, offered him five years. He did not took it because he did not commit the crime. And it cost him his life, Angel Nieves Diaz. And all I can say is, I'll see you soon. But enough of his sad stories. Let me tell you how I got out of there. And I tell you right from the jump, I was not saved by the system. I was saved in spite of the system. I was saved by the grace of God. Miracle, some people might call it luck. Here comes my attorney with tears running down her cheeks. I say, Miss Gail, what's wrong? And she say, one, I cannot handle your case no more. And I say, why, Miss Gail? You know my case better than anybody. I don't need no new lawyers now. And then she said, you know why? I lost five clients. They are your friends. And no mistake when she said she lost five clients. It's five human beings that got executed, murderer, legally murderer, by the state of Florida, by the governor of Florida. If you want to become a criminal lawyer, and I wish you will, we need you, be careful with the death penalty cases they can get to you. So she tells me, don't worry about it, Juan. I'm going to get the see to, to assign for you the three best lawyers they have and the best investigator. I finally got the dream team. So here comes my new lawyer, and he tells me, Melendez, you have lost too many appeals. I tell him, tell me something new. Then he said, but we're going to try one more time. But if you lose this one, you'll be lucky if you live three years. I say, if I lose this one, I'll be lucky if I live a year and a half. You know who the governor of Florida is. He will have no problem in signing my death one. So his target was to send the investigator out to see my trial defense lawyer. Remember, the one who used to pat me in the back. And the first murder occurred. My trial defense lawyer just became a judge. And I thank God for that. You see, by him becoming a judge, it creates in the legal world a conflict of instruments. And that conflict of instruments gave me the opportunity to boom my case out of that racist county, out of the county they fabricated the case against me, out of, out of the county where the good old boy network operates. And it moves from Balto, Port County, Florida. And by the way, please don't go over there. It moves to Hillsborough County, Tampa, Florida. And it falls in the hands of a brave, brave woman. A woman that wants to do the right thing. And I can sincerely say, without hesitating, that I owe this person my life. Her name is Honorable George 
Barbara Fletcher. So going back to the story when my investigator going to see my trial defense lawyer, who just, they used to pat me in the back, who just became a judge, he tells her, I'm a judge now. I have a new office. But in the old office where I used to do my defense work, I believe it's a box in there with the name Melendez Ronan on it. You can go in there and have it. So she rushed over there to that old office, got that box, went to her office, and went inside the box and dug out a tape cassette, and she played it. Guess what? The confession of the real killer was in that tape cassette. And my trial defense attorney had it one month, one month before trial. So this opened a can of wounds now. The case is in the hand of a brave woman that wants to do the right thing. So after Honorable Judge Barbara Fletcher listened to the tape confession of the real killer, she immediately made a court order to the prosecutor's office. They want to prosecute me and demand that he sent any papers, any notes, any documents of my case if he had it to do so, and he did. Guess what? He had a copy, a transcript of the tape confession of the real killer. He also had it one month before trial. But he had something else too. He had 16 documents that corroborated the tape confession of the real killer. 16, doc 16 documents that he never turned in to trial defense lawyer at the time of the trial. What creates in the legal world a Brady rule violation. Will hold an exculpatory evidence, evidence that indicate that you did not commit the crime. By that time, I already had three eventuality hearings. And I was able to establish more than 20 witnesses that also corroborated the take confession of the real killer, including the wife and sister of the real killer, including law enforcement, law enforcement officers, criminal lawyers, friends of the real killer. In the end, they found physical evidence against the real killer. The real killer was also a police informant. So now, so now, Honorable Barbara Fletcher got all this ammunition, and she decided to write a 72 page opinion on it. And that 70, 70, 72 page opinion, she chastised the prosecutor for the way he handled the case. She chastised law enforcement for the way they, they investigated the case. And she chastised the man that pat me in the back for the way he called himself defending me. And she grabbed me, uttered me a new trial. And she let her know that the case was terrible damage. Implying you have an innocent man in their role. The prosecutor is not to process the case, dismiss the case, drop the case. And that's why I'm here, thank God, talking to all of you. I never know the time and date they was going to release me. It caught me totally by surprise. They put shackles in my legs, changed in my waist, and handcuffs in my wrists. And they took me to a place they called the information room, not too far where the death penalty place is. And they sent me in a chair, in front of me is a desk, and behind the desk is a lady working on computers. And she started making, answering me some silly, naive, stupid questions. She asked me for my social security number. I give it to her, I know about her, but I wonder why. Then she came up with some more silly, naive, stupid questions. Where are you working at? Who are you working for? What type of job you have? And I must give her, a real look, because she got up the chair and put both hands in the desk that was in front of me, and, and she said, Melendez, you do, do not have, you do not understand what's going on in here, do you? I say, lady, I don't have the slightest idea. I live across the streets. I've been in there almost 18 years. I'm in their row. They don't have no jobs in their row. And then, she came real close to me, almost whispering in my ears. And she say, Melendez, we are facing your paperwork. They're going to release you today. And I do not know if you watch cartoons. And you see this cartoon character. He takes a slow hammer. He's the other one inside the head with a boom. And you can see that now this going straight up. Then he have a ring and star all around his head. He's in a state of shock, but he's smiling. That's how I was. In a state of shock, but smiling. And I'm still smiling today. And then the correctional officer, they start acting different. They offer me sandwiches and soda pops. 
I don't want no sandwich. I don't want no soda pop. I want to go back to my cell, pack everything up, and get the hell out of here. <laughs> then I had to tell it physical. And I never see these people work so fast. They was moving everybody out of the way. I was first for everything. And then they start calling me something they never called me before. They start calling me Mr. Melendez. And I liked that. <laughs> so now I'm in my cell, packing everything up. And I want to say goodbye to my friend in the last cell. I'm in the, in the cell next to last. And I got a smile in my face and tears of joy running down my cheeks. But when I got in front of him, I couldn't, do, I couldn't say nothing to him. You see, I was happy, but all of a sudden something hit me. I'm leaving, and I'm leaving them behind. The ones that taught me how to read, how to write, how to speak English, and such a stand, how to let hate go. And I know what's going to happen. If we do not abolish the death penalty, I know their destiny. They probably kill them all. He had tears running down his cheeks. He had a smile on his face. But he was able to talk. And this is the, the sad words that came out of his mouth. The first word that came out of his mouth was this like this. Don't get in no trouble there. Then he say, take care of yourself. Then he say, don't forget about us. And the last word was, Take care of you, mama. They all know my mama. This person that shared these kind words with me before I left, his name is Clarence Hills. He changed it to Rachab because he became a Muslim. He is a brother out of Alabama. Unfortunately, I have to tell you that on a Wednesday, September the 7th, 2007, he was executed. May God rest his soul. So that's why every one of them was telling me the same thing. And before I get to that door that will lead me out of that floor, out of that wing, I hear a clap. Then I hear a second clap. And a third clap. They were making, making so much noise, clapping their hands, uh, uh, whispering and banging the bar, that the correction officer got angry with them and told them, shut up, be quiet. Then he stopped making noise to have left that place. It was real happy to see me go. So now I'm in the door that's going to lead me to freedom. And when they opened that door, this is what I saw. I saw a whole bunch of reporters. ABC, PBS, uh, the whole letters of the alphabet wasn't there. <laughs> and no offense and no disrespect. But reporters sometimes make some silly, naive, stupid questions. The first one was this like this. How do you feel? I did the Jim Brown on him. I feel good. I'm going home. Then, then come this female reporter with some more crazy questions. Where are you going? What you going to do? What you want to see? I didn't tell her that I want to go to this thing well. I told her, and it came naturally. It came from my heart. I told her I want to, I want to see the moon. I want to see the stars. I want to walk on grass, on dirt. I want to hold a baby in my arm and, and, and play with him. Of course, I told her, I want to talk to some beautiful woman. That reporter I had in front of me, she was ugly. <laughs> but that's a joke in my luck. I miss the things that, that we take for granted, the simple things in life. I cannot understand the people in the free world when they tell me they're bored. When there's so many things that God created for us that we can enjoy, love, and take care. So many good deeds, so many good choices we can make in life. And speaking about good deeds and good choices, I got a confession to make. I'm still a dreamer. I dream and I pray to God every day that in my time I can see the death penalty abolished. But this dream cannot come true if all of you don't get involved in it. You see, you are part of my dream now. The problem with the death penalty is all about education, details. People need to know that is racist. People need to know it do not deter crime. People need to know that is cruel and unnecessary. We had alternatives. People need to know that it costs too much. But the most important thing that people need to know is this. Alone is great state of Florida habit, any state any nation, any country, it always will be a risk to execute 
an innocent one. And we can always release an innocent man from prison. We don't have no problems with that. But we can never, and I repeat, we can never release an innocent man from the grave. And this life we got rid of segregation. And this life we got rid of slavery. White, black, brown, all together in harmony. We can give rid of, rid of it, this madness or the death penalty. So please, join me in my dream and, and move on and let's make this world better, better by abolishing the death penalty. I love you all. God bless you. <laughs> Give me that taste. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you. Give me my taste.